This Birding Adventures episode is powered by Nikon, your world leader in optics since 1917, and sponsored in part by South Texas Nature, featuring the lower Rio Grande Valley, America's richest birding. We're in the Rio Grande Valley in Texas, and I'm holding a Mexican milk snake. Legend has it that these snakes drink milk right from the udders of cows. That of course is not true. These little beauties feed predominantly on rodents, but look at the lovely colors. On this week's show, we're going to be looking for another beautiful and brightly colored animal, the green jay. This week's golden bird. Let's go birding. Now is the time of your life. This is the perfect habitat for this bird. Beautiful plumes. Look at the plumes on the neck and the head. Yeah! That's what I call birding. Awesome. That's our golden bird. Snaking its way all the way from the snow melt of Colorado is the mighty Rio Grande River behind me. This is the fifth longest river in North America and brings life to this otherwise parched landscape. This riverine bush on both sides of this river is home to a whole host of bird species, including this week's golden bird, the green jay. Very fortunate this week to have with us Gavin Bieber from Wings, who's an excellent leader, and Gavin's going to be co-hosting the show with me as we go on our quest for Green Jays. Well, we've woken up to some unusual inclement weather for South Texas, but this is Santa Ana National Wildlife Refuge, and what makes this place so unique is that nearly all the speciality birds from South Texas can be found right here. We're going to be heading out with Gavin. We're going to be looking for birds like plain chachalacas. We're going to look for the unique species of woodpeckers here, like golden-fronted woodpecker and ladder-backed woodpecker, some of the speciality doves and sparrows. And of course, we're going to head out onto the river and look for two very special species of kingfishers. Here we are on the banks of the very muddy Rio Grande River, made a little muddier by the inclemental weather we're experiencing today. And uh, we're on a quest for two species of local kingfishers, which are found in the lower Rio Grande Valley and a little bit to our north. The diminutive, very colorful green kingfisher, which is copper and emerald, and its much larger relative, the ring kingfisher, which resembles the more familiar belted kingfisher, which many of you will have seen all across North America, uh, but has a rich scarlet chest and underbelly. As you can see, James is uh, operating a new kayak made by Hobie is operated completely with his feet, which leaves his hands free for all those fast-moving birds. Pretty neat design, actually. We seem to be in Mexico now. Crossed over onto the other side of the Rio Grande, briefly. James is definitely in Mexico. Yes, I'm looking at an awesome green kingfisher over here. The green kingfisher is in the Chloroserile genus, and there are four species in this genus which extend from South America into Central America. And the green kingfisher is the northernmost occurring species of Chloroserile. This is an amazing little kingfisher, one of only six kingfisher species to be found in Central and South America. They like these overhanging banks of the rivers where they can perch and sight hunt for small minnows in the river. As you can see on these green kingfishers, they have extensive white spotting in the wing. That's one really useful way to tell them apart from their larger relative, the Amazon kingfisher, which has a wide distribution and comes actually very close to the Texas border in Mexico. Maybe someday might actually occur here along the Rio Grande. Another large relative of the green kingfisher, the ringed kingfisher, was to be found a little bit further downriver. 
quite incredible to think that of the six species of kingfisher found in the Americas, three of them occur right here in the Rio Grande Valley. One of the speciality species of sparrow that we're going to be looking for is the tiny olive sparrow, a particularly good looking little sparrow species. And Gavin right now is pushing for one to see if we can lure one out from the undergrowth here in this grassy understory. Gavin's pishing resulted in the bird hopping up from the understory and giving us cracker views. The endearing black crested titmouse is the only species of titmouse found here in the Rio Grande Valley. It is the recent taxonomic split from the tufted titmouse. Santa Ana is a really important place for birds because um, we live in an area where 95% of the habitat is gone and so there are very few places left. And so Santa Ana provides a really important piece of habitat for these birds from the Mississippi and the Central Flyway who are migrating through as well as the birds that are coming from south. And so uh, if, if you look at it sort of from a, a, an aerial scale, you'll see that Santa Ana is just sort of this little island of habitat that's just surrounded by fields of agriculture. So it's, a, it's really important to birds. One of the most important things that we do here to manage the habitat for birds is we recreate the flooding of the Rio Grande. Historically, uh, that, that river would flood just across the landscape and it would just sheet across the landscape. But now, with the establishment of Falcon Dam, the river's been cut off and that flooding doesn't happen. So what we do here is we go in and we re-flood what uh, locally is known as a risacas, or the risaca system that we have here, uh, which, are, which are old oxbow lakes. And so we mimic the historic flooding of the Rio Grande since it no longer naturally occurs. Before leaving Santa Ana, we notched up some of the other speciality species, like Altamira aureole, golden-fronted and ladder-backed woodpeckers, and the tiny and confiding buff-bellied hummingbird. These hummingbirds only just extend into the United States, right here in extreme southeast Texas, although small numbers can be found overwintering on the Gulf Coast further north. They've got this pretty distinctive half and half coloring on the underside and a black tipped red bill. Like most hummingbird species, they are extremely adept at maneuvering in these short stop start flights through the tangled undergrowth of forested habitat. Santa Ana is a wonderful place to visit. We have 12 miles of trails, and um, where I'm sitting right here is right in front of the visitor center, and we have people who come and just sit here and, and just watch birds all day long. If we really want to go birding from the edge, we've got to go to the edge of the United States of America. And the way I see it, the edge of the United States is the middle of the Rio Grande River. Let's go birding from the edge. This birding from the edge segment is brought to you by Nikon, manufacturers of the Edge line of optics. Now, I'm in the middle of the Rio Grande River. The question is, if I see a bird in the middle of the river, does it go on my Mexican list or my American list? Oh, the dilemmas we face in bird watching. That's birding from the edge. Our quest for green jays led us through some of Hidalgo County's premier birding sites. On our way from Santa Ana National Wildlife Refuge to Quinta Mazatlan, we stopped in at the Hidalgo Pump House. This is a historic building which houses these massive, giant, steam-driven pumps and these pumps have transformed the landscape of the Rio Grande Valley from native brush to agricultural land. And the grounds surrounding this historical building are about 600 acres in size, managed by the US Fish and Wildlife Service, are great for a whole variety of doves and also for birds like the tropical kingbird. There is no region in the United States that can compare to the Rio Grande for the number of dove and pigeon species. Some of the very special range-restricted species include white-winged dove, Inca dove, common ground dove, and the white-tip dove, all of which are easily found throughout the Rio Grande Valley. One of the better wetland spots in the Rio Grande Valley is Estero Llano Grande. This is a 200-acre park, 
and its old converted agricultural land and these impoundments of water are very, very suitable for a couple of key species, one of them being least grebe and another being neotropic cormorant. So we're going to head in here and try and see if we can see these birds. The walk to the least grebe ponds revealed one of nature's best examples of camouflage, the common paraki. This is a bird whose range extends just into the Rio Grande Valley area. And is a very, very special bird. Look how cryptically camouflaged he is, sitting literally four feet away from us over here. Well, we found what we came here for, least grebe and neotropic cormorant. Nice, huh? Yeah, it's great. I really like these least grebes. I kind of have to come down to South Texas to see them regularly in North America. A lot of people think they look like pie bill grebes, but that golden eye and a really nice black cap and dark slaty gray uh, face and cheeks really sets them off. It's a smart looking bird. So this is probably one of the best spots to see least grebe, right? It sure is in the States. These neotropic cormorants are kind of nice too. Especially Just to the left there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very nice. Still partly in breeding plumage. And this slender and longer tail than the double crested cormorant with a nice white line around the gate and uh, much less orange in the throat. No orange over the eye like the double crested cormorants are. Right. You really notice that long tail when you see them flying. Really sticks out. It's a very diagnostic characteristic of, of neotropic cormorant. And they extend way, way to the south, all the way to the southern tip of Chile in Argentina. We're here for lunch at the Valley Nature Center. Before we have lunch, we're gonna set up our trusty bird cams to see what images we can get of birds coming into the feeders here. I'm gonna set up one on the ground and one on a tripod to see what hummingbirds come into the hummingbird feeders. At the Nature Center here, you can find chachalacas, uh, great kiskadees, golden-fronted woodpeckers, white-tipped dove, a lot of the regular South Texas specialty species. And it's fairly easy bird watching here. It's uh, six acres and you can walk, uh, the trail's really easy and things are easy to find here. So it's a great place. Oh, over here. Duck down. There we go. Yeah. Nice curve-built thrasher there. Okay. Beautiful. We've got a curve-built thrasher over here. It's a member of the Mimidia family, which is the same family as the mockingbirds. Thrashers get their name from the way that they feed on the ground, thrashing from side to side, tossing the leaf litter out of the way. Two species that we're looking for here, curveball thrasher and longbill thrasher, both found in the south of the United States. The longbill thrasher has a much more limited range and is limited to this sort of area of South Texas. This is a great kiskadee. It's one of the large tyrant flycatchers. It gets its name from Kiskidi, it's onomatopoeic. It's the noise that it makes in Spanish. It's called Biente Veo, which means good to look at. These Kiskidis are one of the few passerine birds that actually will dive for fish and tadpoles in little pools of water. They're also highly aggressive birds. Kiskidis will often be seen mobbing large raptors. It's also believed that they have a very foul tasting flesh with a sort of level of toxin in them as well. And that's quite interesting because it might be a defense mechanism to stop them from being preyed upon by other bird species. We've got the longbill thrasher here. Come and have a look. Very pretty. Longbill thrasher. Look at that beautiful blotching on the breast. What a pretty bird. Notice those nice rusty upper parts and the heavy streaking underneath. Great cheeks. Definitely a plainer bird. It's not as rich brown as the brown thrasher, but what a beautiful bird. Another one of the birds you have to come here to see. Exactly. Good job. After viewing the thrashers satisfactorily for a few minutes, we headed back to check the bird cam and got these excellent shots of chachalacas, including a curious youngster. So the nature center here is definitely an urban environment. We're sitting right in the town of Westlaco. We have six acres right here in the middle of town. And it really goes to prove what you can do with a small area. It shows our citizens that they can plant native plants and help out all the wildlife all around us here. And uh, it's really cool because we have a lot of kids that come here for school field trips. They get to learn about the habitats. They can recreate it in their schoolyards or at home. So it's very important a place to showcase what our natives are. This morning, we're at an incredible place called Quinta Mazatlan in McAllen. 
This is a 15 acre urban oasis, which also happens to be the highest point in McAllen at 27 feet. We're here to look for one particular bird, the green jay. It's important to preserve the, these urban hotspots because they're, they're so little otherwise, and the cities tend to be fairly dense as, as they are in many areas, and so some species can nest successfully as long as there's a few trees, but many need some, some foliage, some undergrowth, and a variety of plants. And so places like Quinta that was privately owned until fairly recently are important because they provide habitat for a whole host of birds that wouldn't be here otherwise. And they can also manage the area and deal with invasive plant species and provide food. The other thing where they're really important is for environmental education. Quinta brings in many school groups and the kids learn about observing nature as well. So there's a lot of interest in native plants here where people are looking for native plants, for butterflies and for birds, even water features. And it's all a mosaic, so the more people that have the native plants and get a good foliage at the lower levels as well as above, the more likely you are to have birds kind of moving around. And we have birds here throughout the year, both breeding the migrants and the wintering species. There's over 500 species that have been reported here, but obviously they need habitat, so that contributes. Oh, we've got a clay-colored robin over here. We've been looking for one for a little while. We've had a couple juveniles go by, but this is our first adult. Really attractive bird. It's sort of subtle colors, but uh, that lemon yellow bill is quite nice. It's a recent colonizer to South Texas, uh, arriving here about 20 years ago. It's becoming slightly more common, but still only just along the Rio Grande border here. Now, though the clay-colored robin is fairly rare here in Texas and quite range-restricted, it's a wide-ranging species that goes well into the Neotropics and is actually one of the most common garden birds in places like Panama and Costa Rica and much of Mexico. And interestingly enough, I, I call it clay-colored robin sometimes and clay-colored thrush sometimes, it's because there's been a recent shift in the common name of the species. We call a, our American robin a robin because it has an orange breast, much like the European robin does. So the settlers, when they came to the North America, named it robin. When in fact, all of the robins here in North America are thrushes, and we're slowly changing the names over from robin to thrush. So the official name of this bird now is clay-colored thrush. Finding the clay-colored thrush was a welcome diversion, but soon it was back to the task at hand and our efforts were rewarded with a passing family group of green jays. These are spectacularly colored jays, member of the corvid family, bright green. They epitomize the color green with this beautiful blue head as well and beautiful green colors on the feathers. They seem to like these oak trees around at Quinta Mazatlan and what a beautiful group of birds. That was awesome, huh? Oh, it was fantastic. It's one of the birds you definitely have to come here to see in the States. And uh, you know, in Mexico and further south where they're quite common, they can be pretty hard to see. So it's great we had such good views. That's awesome. Now there's a, another subspecies of green jay, which is found in South America. They're separated by thousands of miles, these two populations. The South American population is called the Inca jay, and this Central American population, which extends just into the United States, is called the green jay. There is some motivation by some authors to actually split the two into two separate species. You know, these birds are just so stunning that our glimpses of the Kintamazatlan birds were just not enough. We've just been at Kintamazatlan where we've seen some green jays. They're quite a furtive species. They like to hide in thick undergrowth but probably the best place in all of the Rio Grande to find them is right here at Laguna Atascosa National Wildlife Refuge. Well, green jays are a nesting bird here in the valley. They also live here year round and they build a stick nest about 15 to 20 feet up in the trees in dense thorn scrub or thorn forest or riparian forest habitat. And when they raise their young the first time, they're of course feeding them, but then when they're getting ready to nest again, they, they kick out those birds. But they do exist in groups throughout the winter. Yes, that's our golden bird, green jay. I'm getting some awesome views through these Nikon Edge binoculars. Look at that blue on the head. Those black markings on the head, beautiful green on the back. Bright yellow tail feathers. What a beautiful bird, green jay. That is awesome, hey? Oh, what a fantastic. pretty bird. Fantastic. It's got to be the most pretty corvid out there. 
you'd struggle to find a corvid that comes close to the colors of this bird. Yep, it almost has too many colors on it. Yep. So, Gav, how did you start off bird watching? Well, my uh, family was uh, into birds. So, from a very early age, back when I was four, all of, all of our family vacations were bird watching holidays. So, I kind of got into it really early. And what's been your highlight of birding in the Rio Grande Valley? Oh, so many good birds down here. It's just such a fantastic place to come. Uh, I've been coming down here for about 20 years. Uh, I never get tired of these green jays, though. They're, they are just gorgeous. Absolutely. Well, well, thank you so much for guiding us on this trip. Oh, my pleasure. You've been great, really professional, and wow, we've seen some awesome birds this we, trip. We sure have. It's Thanks been, so much, guys. Great fun.